So this is the content. And I'm just going to work through this in the order. Uh, can somebody over there get the lights? Thank you. Um, just in the order that it's been provided for us. So we have some vocab. Autosomal chromosome versus sex chromosomes. This is inherently clear and we've covered it in lecture or we need to work on it. Yay, clear, murmur, not clear. One, two, three. Yay. Okay, so autosomal, normal content, sex chromosome, has a role in determining your sex. In humans, it's X and Y. Two X's for a female, XY for a male. Um, come back to me if there's problems with this. Okay, this, I guarantee, is not perfectly clear in all minds here. You have a bunch of different terms for a bunch of different chunks of DNA. So what do they all represent? A gene is a specific piece of information on, um, it's really across chromosomes. So genes have names, they do specific jobs. So think of our enzymes. If you want to say something like, you know, uh, hydrogen peroxidase, if there's one gene for that. It's, what it's the piece of DNA that encodes that protein and the associated regulatory stuff that goes with it. So not only do you have to know how to make a peroxidase, you have to know how to turn it on and what kind of cells. So there's instructions for that um, associated with the actual place where that gene lives on the chromosome. Okay. When you talk about a gene, you can be talking about a spot on either of the homologous chromosomes. Okay. So the same then is th the same is therefore true of a gene locus. Look at how locus is spelled to determine its ontology. You'll say locus location is all that means. This is where on the chromosome that gene lives. Okay. An allele. I I want to assert that this is probably the most confusing one. An allele is a version of a particular gene. So from mom, you have allele A. From dad, you have allele B. Allele A and allele B are for each gene. So for your decarboxylase gene, you have version A, <coughs> excuse me, allele A, allele B. For your peroxidase gene, you have allele A and allele B, and so forth, down the whole scope of the 19,000 genes that you have. Um, so, when it's clear that allele means we're talking about a version, it makes sense to talk about the properties of those different versions. And so they're behaviors of what we'll talk about in our genetics. Uh, what we've put on here are dominant alleles and recessive alleles. A dominant allele, you will see the effect, the phenotype of that allele, no matter what other version is in the cell. So dominant, it takes over the circumstances and shows itself. It's the extrovert at this party. Okay. A recessive allele, you will only see the trait characteristic of a recessive allele when it's in the presence of another recessive allele. So if you have version A and version B, you need version A and version B to both be recessive in order to see a recessive trait. It is submissive to any kind of um, properties of a dominant allele. So this can be for any gene. Um, there's an example on there I encourage you to look at. OK, so this is kind of where we go into to story mode about kind of how we, how we started figuring this stuff out. And so we go back to Gregor Mendel and his peas. Did we cover monohybrids already? And so they've gone through this story. Um, we found the characteristic we thought was interesting. We bred it, and we bred it, and we bred it. We inbred it, and we inbred it, and we inbred it until it bred true. That no matter how many times you bred it again, it always produced that characteristic. So the classic is purple or white flowers, or wrinkled or smooth peas, or yellow or green peas. There's a host of these things. Okay. What happens with inbreeding is you homozygose a given locus. Homozygous means that both gene, both alleles 
for a given gene are the same. And if you don't get that terminology now, you will get it later. Homozygous, heterozygous, um, heterozygous meaning you have one copy of each. So these are all homozygous. And we got purple flowers that breed true, white flowers that breed true. When we get them together, um, we take those two true breeding populations, we end up with all purple flowers. And so <coughs> now we're confused. There's a conflict between these two characteristics expressing themselves. Um, so that generation, what we call the F1 generation, the first generation, when you put the two true breeding generations together, we call those hybrids. They are heterozygous in all of the individuals are heterozygous. When we cross those to each other, we get this classic ratio of three expressing the dominant trait and one expressing the recessive trait. And this is never perfect. That's why we're counting corn today. You'll find that even though it hovers around this ratio of 3 to 1, it's going to be more like 2.7 to 1.3. Or it's, you know, it's going to vary. And what made this all so clever when Mendel figured it out was because he could see through those numbers. And there's a trick to that. I want you to write this down. Pay attention to when we do this. When you do your counting, you divide by one of the numbers to see if you get a nice ratio for the other one. Typically, you'll divide by the smallest number. So that when you have 23 to 77, um, when you've counted 100 kernels, you'll realize that it's something like 3.2 to 1, okay, instead of the 3 to 1. And so after you see that, you can kind of say, oh, yeah, okay, it's, it's around 3 to 1. Okay. So, because there's a terminology problem here that we always get wrong on the test, I just want to stop, I want to point this out, and I want you to take extra special note of this phenomenon. This term, a monohybrid cross, we're going to contrast that with a dihybrid cross, and we're going to contrast it with a test cross. A hybrid cross is when you have generated a generation of pure hybrids that you're going to cross to themselves. The monohybrid means you're only talking about one gene, one locus. When we move to dihybrid, we'll look at two different traits, but the principle will be the same. Each of those traits will be completely heterozygous in this F1 generation. And then we're just going to see what results from them. And the results of that are these 3 to 1 ratios, and in the case of the dihybrid, this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. I need to contrast that from the test cross, which I hope is in the next slide, but otherwise we'll get to it later. Aha, we have to tackle Punnett square. And this is another point where I want you to be very lucid about um, a couple of different terms and how it's organized and what it is. So this is supposed to represent all the different possible combinations from a given set of parents. And this is a representation of one single gene. And it's laid out for our monohybrid cross. So I'm going to torture a volunteer. Anybody at the outset? Line? Sam's volunteer. Where is a parent? Just go point it out. Yes, he has pointed out female and male. Super. So, John. Where's the offspring? Yes, there are four potential outcomes, yes? Now, here's the part that gets people. Where are the sex cells? Where are the sperm? Where are the eggs? Volunteer. Herbie pointed her hand. Go for it. Get up there. Show me one. One what? One germ cell. She has pointed to this. Is she correct on the count of three? One, two, three. She is. So what these lines here are meant to convey are the total possible gametes that those parents can produce. Because in a monohybrid cross, we're only looking at one gene, 
one gene only, and we have, we know that it's heterozygous. We know that there is a dominant allele that's represented by a capital letter. We know that there's a recessive allele for the white that's represented by the small letter. Because we know that it's heterozygous and we're only worried about one gene, we annotate those genes like this. It can either pass along the dominant one or it can pass along the recessive one. And that's true of both parents. So we line them up like this and we fill out when they combine. So this is dominant, dominant, it's purple. This is dominant, recessive, it's purple. This is dominant, recessive as well, it's purple. This is recessive, recessive, it's white. So when I ask you, where are the gametes, you will point to that row and that column and we'll get 100% on that question, yes? Even when we move to dihybrids and it gets confusing as get out. God help us for tri um, trihybrids. Okay, so here's the dihybrid. The same principles apply, except we're considering two different genes. Remember, we represent dominant alleles as capital letters, having to do with the actual characteristics. So in this case, R for round, little r for wrinkly, because it's not round. Um, and then yellow and green, um, capital Y and Y, respectively. Now, if you have them hybrid for both characteristics, for both genes, um, they'll take on this pers uh, appearance of yellow and round. But when you cross them together, you get bit bunches of combinations of different uh, phenotypes or traits. So to write out the total possibility of all the gametes that they can make, you have to say there can be dominant dominant, dominant recessive, recessive dominant, or recessive recessive. And the same is true of its inbred cousin, brother, sister. Okay. When you get these together, you write out all the combinations and you m end up with this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. That's something you have to investigate, but remember, when I ask you where the gametes are, and when you're trying to figure out how to construct one of these when you have a blank piece of paper, remember your job is to represent all of the possible gametes from a single parent. You need to understand how we write it when you're talking about a diploid parent. So there is two copies for each gene, round, round, yellow, yellow, and that being haploid, there's only going to be one letter here for each, total of two. So while I've made this very mundane, and I apologize, this is a very basic thing that I think you're probably going to have to actually practice. And when left in isolation, say, oh, I've seen it explained a hundred times, I know what's going on. Yet, still, when we come down to this, people are writing RRYY as their gametes, and they're ending up with eight letters in their opponent's square. Or they're ending up with two feet. Furby, you had a question. You can do a, a cross to determine whatever you want about them genetically. And um, what this is just illustrating a nice even distribution in a nice system where it's nicely dominant or recessive. It's a nice textbook example. The other thing that we'll consider is a test cross, which will take an unknown, okay? You want to find out what it is. That's why it's a test. And you'll cross it to um, a known standard. And that standard will almost always be homozygous recessive because when you cross that out the only way to detect a recessive gene in your unknown is to cross it to another recessive and you need to know the ratio of recessives going in so we just say it's recessive 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 I'll show you that in one slide probably fair enough Okay, so yes indeed, the test cross. And we need to be able to do this for monohybrid and dihybrid. Let's just consider the monohybrid. You have an unknown critter, in this case a flower. It's unknown because it's purple. If you have a white flower, is it unknown? No, you know it's recessive. So, but if it's purple, it could be heterozygous or it could be homozygous dominant. Um, and we're really just cutting to the chase here. We're telling you how to test this. So you cross it with recessive, recessive. So you cross it with a true breeding white. 
um, denoted here. So is it capital capital or is it capital small? Cross it with this. You write out your possible combinations. If um, so, who are we saying? We're saying that data is the um, is the white flower. So it can only contribute the lower case. And that's true in both cases. This is a case study. Is it case one or is it case two? In case one, if it's homozygous dominant, what you would expect is these combinations, all purple. Mom would be forced to donate a dominant gene, so we would get all purple genes, despite dad always contributing a white gene. However, if this is heterozygous, if it's a hybrid, mom will choose to either donate a dominant or a recessive, and the combination will come um, and it'll give us a ratio of one to one, or really two to two, okay. if we consider the structure of Punnett square. Clear as day? The test is doing it on the dihybrid then. For a dihybrid, uh, please everybody write down your answer before we, we come together. For a dihybrid cross, using our system before, of brown wrinkled, yellow, uh, green. yellow green, which is small yellow, in that system, what critter takes the place of the white flower? What kind of pea plant would you use to perform a dihybrid test cross in that system? Let's take a minute. And this class got the answer correct. Little r, little r, little y, little y. Okay. Um, because we're going to handle these sorts of things in the next period, I'm not going to muddy the water too much, but just keep in mind for now, until Wednesday, that inheritance is not always so simple as dominant and recessive. There are these messy things like co-dominance and incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance makes perfect sense to me. I think it makes sense to a lot of people. If you got a red flower and a white flower, you get them together, you get a pink flower. That's incomplete dominance. Co-dominance is when you see the expression of both traits when, the, when both alleles are present. So instead of red plus white giving you pink, you get red chunks and you get white chunks. To me, that example is pretty confusing because I think of one tissue expressing um, the same set of genes, so I don't know why one set of genes is on and the other is off. I don't get it. The best example for this class of codominance, and you'll be tested on it repetitively, write it down, is human blood types. If you are A, B, or O, the codominant um, case is when you have both A and B expressed in the same cell. Um, and we'll get to the that whole mess next time. I won't further muddy it this time. Um, finally, there's uh, actually I think it's on the next slide, but um, there's also. Uh, a couple of nuances. Pay attention to this term, pleiotropy, which is um, one gene having multiple effects. So this is really important in like developmental contexts where you mutate a developmentally important gene. Not only do you not grow a lung, you don't grow a liver, you don't grow a whatever. Okay? Because they all use the same mechanisms. Um, this is what we're doing today. We're counting corn kernels. This is what they look like. So the purple color, I think, is clear enough. Um, you would count this as purple, I believe. And yellow is when it's only the clearest. And the difference between these two shapes is one of them has starch in them, one of them has sugar in them. Which one is which? Oh, it's already labeled, right? Um, the wrinkled ones are the sugary ones. So what happened is the water evaporated, leaving behind um, just condensed sugar granules, whereas the starch holds its structure better, um, keeps the water surrounding it intact and stays plump. Um, so those are the characteristics we'll be counting. They behave simple, uh, according to simple dominance. Um, 